The General Electric Company has had their hands in a lot of different industries over the years. However, in the early 20th century, they decided to start tinkering with the possibility of creating locomotives. Most of this was done in affiliation with other locomotive manufacturers, but towards the middle of the century, they decided to strike out for themselves, and eventually, they would rise to dominance, dethroning the former dominant EMD. Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains electrified. And today, we are going to discuss GE, or General Electric, which, I mean, I talked about EMD before, and it seems reasonable that I should talk about the other dominant diesel manufacturer when it came to, well, the American market especially. Although both companies were, of course, worldwide, and had significant income from the export market as well. This is the story of General Electric's foray into locomotives. Now before we even get started, it's important to recognize that General Electric, as a company, is a multinational conglomerate. They're huge, and they have a lot of different subsidiaries, and a lot of different products they actually are responsible for. They're more like Fairbanks Morse when it comes to their general history, but they're even larger than that because they made just so much stuff, and still do, because they're still around. Their formation dates back to 1889 with Thomas Edison, who had business interests in many different electrically related companies, since the vast majority of his patents did feature electric technology. He was an innovator when it came to that, and was credited with the invention of a ton of different electrical components. Now, many people give Edison a lot of flack because he was probably more of a businessman than an inventor. He had a lot of employees that also helped him with his work, and not every patent that was credited to him was necessarily all him or even him in general, it's just he owned the company. Edison could be his own video, and I do think he gets a little unfairly slandered in the modern day, as he wasn't as bad as people make him out to be, but there were a few things he did that were a little unscrupulous, I'll admit. And for time's sake, let's just press forward. The companies he had interest in at the time included the Edison Lamp Company, Edison Machine Works, and Edison Electric Light Company, the latter of which was actually financially backed by the legendary J.P. Morgan and the Vanderbilt family, so there was a lot of money involved around this. Edison himself was already particularly wealthy by this point, but he was backed by some of the wealthiest people in America, too. What happened was, Drexel Morgan & Company, which was founded by J.P. Morgan and Anthony J. Drexel, wound up financing Edison's research and helped merge together several different companies that Edison actually had under one corporation, which formed the Edison General Electric Company, which was incorporated in New York on April 24th, 1889. That new company almost immediately acquired the Sprague Electric Railway and Motor Company. And while not every single company Edison was responsible for was under the merger, most of them were. Over the years, the name actually dropped Edison, and was named just the General Electric Company because that's what they did. Pretty much anything that involved electricity is what they were focusing on. Light bulbs, power generation, you name it, they probably did it. Into the 1900s, they started dealing with radios and then televisions. Still later, they were working with computer components. General Electric, again, had their hands in just so many different markets. So it's not surprising that they're still one of the wealthiest companies in the world, with their reported revenue in 2022 being $76.56 billion. They have been savagely successful, and if I went into every single avenue of their corporate structure, we would literally be here all day. They are a mammoth of a topic, but we're not here for everything they did. You guys just want to know about the trains, the locomotives, 
When did they start doing that? Well, for that topic, we have to dabble into one of their subsidiaries, known as General Electric Transportation. General Electric had actually produced their first locomotive all the way back in 1912, which was known as the GE 57-ton Gas Electric Box Cab. Early on, they really liked box cabs, and this early foray into that market was actually not that bad. It was not a diesel, however. She ran on gasoline, with an internal combustion electric drive, rather than the mechanical drive systems that weren't working very well at the time for rail propulsion anyway. These locomotives were actually very closely related to doodlebugs, but they weren't meant for passenger service. They were switchers. They were small, but easy to work with and maintain, and fairly powerful for their size. And the technological development that General Electric was working with would set the stage for their future as a locomotive manufacturer. GE Transportation had a heck of a time trying to get the Prime Mover to work well with their electric traction motors. The power between the two had to match, because if that was mismanaged at all, it would literally damage the components. GE developed control systems that would simplify that task and increase efficiency in subsequent years. Those systems were considered state-of-the-art, and would continue to develop them over the following decades, and would help push the widespread adoption of both gasoline and eventually diesel-powered electric drive systems into the 1920s, the 30s, and the 40s. Their original locomotive, number 100, actually still survives, believe it or not. She changed hands quite a few times, and she's on display at the Minnesota Transportation Museum at their Jackson Street Roundhouse in St. Paul. So, hey, that's actually really cool. And once again, as usual, to go over a complete list of every single locomotive they've been responsible for would take all day, but I'll give you a few highlights. Not only did they mess around with box cabs and switchers on their own to a certain degree, but they also had a habit of working a lot with other companies. That included both a very early EMD, then EMC, and Alco, who were still learning the ways of the electrical side of things. But General Electric's components were, again, state of the art. And early on, GE was totally willing to partner with other companies if it benefited them, as long as the product sold well. General Electric didn't foray too much into diesel engine development at that point, so most of their solo outings were rather small. They stuck with switchers, unless we're talking about pure electric locomotives. And in fact, it was one of their first partnerships with Alco that predated their gasoline box cab. The box cab was their first solo outing, but the S motor was their first locomotive in general that they worked with with someone else. Alco and GE were responsible for the S motors, which were direct current electric locomotives, and actually wound up serving into the days of Penn Central. Yes, really, they were that useful. They would continue foraying into electric locomotives over the years and into solo outings with them. They were responsible, of course, for the incredible EP2s built for the Milwaukee Road, as well as the absolutely legendary Pennsylvania Railroad GG1s. General Electric was definitely building quality stuff. And even into the 30s, they started screwing around with some weird tech. They were responsible for steam turbines, the only steam locomotives they ever built, technically, in 1938 for Union Pacific. Those, those didn't go super well. They also later messed with gas turbines, too. The point is, General Electric was all over the place when it came to the locomotive development, but I think most of you really want to hear about the diesels, the diesel electric specifically. While they kept occasionally dabbling into pure electric locomotives, not many railways in America anyway were electrifying that much of their lines despite the incredible cost-saving measures that were realized when they did that. Despite the incredible cost-saving measures that were realized when they did that, I said despite. Anyway, into the 1940s, besides the occasional switcher, General Electric wasn't super interested in doing their own solo foray into the locomotive market. They were content to keep working with Alco, supplying them with the electrical gears as well as their own marketing and servicing infrastructure. Alco was responsible for the locomotive bodies and the diesel engine prime movers. 
But over the course of the 30s through World War II and into the late 40s, EMD was getting a lot more dominant in the market. They'd been purchased by General Motors, which gave them a ton of financial backing as well as marketing. The dieselization of America's locomotive system was starting to rapidly pick up, and EMD was in a prime spot to accommodate the needs of railroads who suddenly wanted more diesels. Whereas Baldwin was not in a position to do anything, neither was Lima, Alco was in a better spot, but only because they were working with General Electric, but even with that, Alco was struggling. Alco Prime Movers, at least early on, weren't really that great. They weren't as reliable as EMDs, and that was a serious problem, because not only did it annoy railroads who just didn't want to buy as many diesels from Alco as they would EMD, but it seriously annoyed General Electric, because GE was giving them state-of-the-art electrical components. Their stuff was good. They were doing everything right. There was nothing wrong with the electrical systems of these diesels because GE had done it. It was Alco. And as Alco continued to struggle and their financial situation got worse and worse, General Electric had finally had enough in 1953. EMD was too dominant and Alco wasn't cutting it. So fine, we'll do it ourselves. They dissolved their partnership with Alco and began developing their own diesels in-house. By 1956, they'd launched their Universal series, which was successful enough to establish them as the main competitor to EMD. Suddenly, EMD actually had a worthy challenger, someone who was in a position to actually push back against them. General Electric, much like General Motors, had a lot of money and a lot of skill with marketing and financing. They knew the game well and proceeded to almost immediately push back against the very dominant EMD, both companies leaving behind the former dominant forces in the locomotive market in America. Baldwin, Lima, and Alco were all gone. And now, at this point, it was pretty much just General Electric and EMD. But as long as EMD kept making good products, they should be fine. They built up a solid reputation, they had just as good marketing, and they still had the majority market share. How could General Electric possibly compete with them? I mean, were their diesels that much better? And no, not early on! But EMD started screwing up, and that's always bad when you have a sufficient competitor to deal with. General Electric followed up the Universal series with their Dash 7 series, which failed to rapidly build their market share, though that was also about the time that EMD threw out the SD40-2s, and yeah, that was not gonna be trumped. Those were too good. But EMD made a fatal mistake, and finally, for once, delivered a bad product. Many of you pointed this out in the EMD video, that in May of 1981, EMD delivered the SD50, which, um, yes, I understand why you thought that this was an odd omission. I didn't bring it up because EMD's biggest problem would come later, because they were dominant enough to recover from a single bad product. But the SD50s were garbage, really garbage. They weren't very good, and railroads were unhappy for once. And that meant that the time was right for General Electric to throw out their Dash 8 series. The Dash 8s were both powerful and reliable, and that was really important because that's what railroads wanted. They wanted a good product, and that's what the Dash 8s were. They followed it up with the Dash 9s and eventually the Evolution series. And over time, General Electric began to push hard back on EMD's market share to the point that it became dominant in the industry. But what was EMD doing? It was just one bad product. Well, that was the bigger problem that I did mention because it was far more critical. EMD had failed to develop a solid four-stroke diesel engine, whereas General Electric had done this. And that held back many of EMD's later decent diesels, ones that actually did work. It wasn't until they ironed out the tech that they were able to do that, but by then, General Electric was dominating the market. Even when General Electric made a bad thing, they had eight other good things, so it was like, whatever. The Dash 8s, the Dash 9s, and the incredible evolutions were destroying EMD, to the point that General Motors sold them. And now EMD isn't even a company, it's just a brand name. The actual company is Progress Rail, owned by Caterpillar. But what's the deal with General Electric these days? Are they still doing well? And, well, the main company is, they're fine, but they actually sold off their locomotive division. General Electric Transportation was sold on February 25th, 2019 to Wabtec, which is the Westinghouse Air Brake Technologies Corporation. They still retain the same name, but they're just under a new parent company. 
but why would General Electric want to do that? That seems bizarre, and frankly, I think it's down to the current situation on American rail lines. The other thing that held EMD back was emissions. General Electric was able to develop the Evolution series, for example, which was able to comply with the EPA's emission regulations on locomotives, whereas EMD struggled to do that for a while, but even with that, it was becoming harder and harder to make diesels that were even permitted to run on America's railroads because the EPA said no, too many emissions, which I think is hysterical because how many, how many trucks are on the road, EPA? I'm sorry, you don't think that's more important to worry. If, if we're dealing with emissions, I'm just saying one of these things is producing way more than the other. It, it's all I'm trying to say. <clears throat> anyway, so General Electric just kind of had enough of dealing with it. It was too much of a headache. It wasn't so much that they weren't profitable. They just didn't want to deal with the market that they felt wasn't really going anywhere. Some have even believed that the EPA may make it so that railroads can't produce any emissions at all, which... <laughs> Okay, but the point is that General Electric was put in an awkward position, and they decided to just cut their losses before they had any losses. WAPT has taken up ownership, and they're honestly a pretty good company, so I'm sure General Electric Transportation is going to do fine. But my whole thing is this. You are General Electric. Let me say that again. You are General Electric. Have you considered? Hear me out on this talking with these American railroad companies and maybe, just maybe, convincing them to perhaps, possibly, maybe, I don't know, put wires over their lines, you know, like a normal person, and perhaps, maybe, maybe just maybe, manufacturing some of those great pure electric locomotives you once made? Because you have a history of doing that, a cherished history. You made really good ones. You are in a perfect position to actually do that as long as the American railroad industry is willing to take you up on the offer. I mean, heck, you guys could run the lines. Like, you were literally the company to do that. But no, the latest thing from them is they're trying to develop battery locomotives. Because, ugh, okay, look, I am so over that. Um, it, it's not going to be a solid replacement, guys. It, it's not going to. I'm just saying. I, I just can't see that being a thing. The, the range, the range is really where I'm at with it. Um... You, of course, realize that if you were to run wires over the tracks, you wouldn't have to worry about range literally at all as long as the wires were there, right? Like, you could even do a hybrid setup. Like, sure, manufacture a battery-powered locomotive, but, but do the wires too. That way it could charge off the lines. I mean, there's a way to do this that makes way more sense than what you're currently doing, is what I'm trying to say. But batteries are all the rage right now, so I shouldn't be surprised. And either way, I just can't see General Electric really going anywhere anytime soon. They still, to this day, hold a 70% market share of the diesel-electric locomotive market. So, yeah, unless something ridiculous happens, they will be just fine. And we will continue to see General Electric-produced locomotives on America's rail system for years to come. As long as the EPA doesn't ruin that. And the railroads themselves. We have a lot of problems to sort out these days. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, I'm just going to end the video now. And with that, a special thank yous to all my underwater train finders, Subdu 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Josh Jotson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Row Videos, Hayden Negro, Master of None, Lord Hoff 444, The Baxter, The Guy with the Beard, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DN Travel Typhoon, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2860, Icerfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Dr. Razor 78, Ohio Trucker 1, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, and Hannah Bird. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.